This meeting is now being recorded. All right. So this is uh, Steve Bidding Young with the Union Exchange Scientists. We're having a recorded session with Elizabeth Gronlin, Senior Scientist and Co-Director of the Global Security Program at Union of Concerned Scientists to discuss the future of U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons programs and the 3 plus 2 program. Elizabeth, uh, please take it away. Okay, um, so I want to make a distinction between uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear warheads um, because a lot of discussion, at least in the United States, about um, uh, building new submarines and new missiles and new um, air launch cruise missiles and all of that uh, is um, going to be very expensive uh, and there's a lot of discussion about it. I'm going to talk about the warheads, um, not the delivery systems. So, I'm having a look, let's see here. Okay, so um, as I think most of you know, until uh, 92, the U.S. Um, basically, there was an ongoing cycle of uh, warheads. Um, there was development, which entailed nuclear testing and production and deployment and retirement, and then it would start over again. And um, it, there was really no, people didn't really give any thought to how long these uh, warheads would last because the assumption was that they would be replaced by something new. And then we had the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which had two goals, to prevent the non-nuclear weapon states from developing nuclear weapons in the first place and to prevent the nuclear weapon states from building new types of weapons. And that's a question. Uh, did the halt in nuclear testing actually uh, mean that there could be no new warheads um, that I'm going to talk about? But at least the plan was that the U.S. would refurbish its existing warheads to extend their lifetime. Um, and so uh, probably most of you know this, but for those who might not, um, What's in a warhead? Well, there are lots and lots and lots of pieces. Um, the piece that I am most interested in is called a nuclear explosive package, or the physics package, which is shown over here on the right, which consists of the, uh, the primary and the high explosives around the primary and the secondary. Um, so this question of what can you do um, without testing, was answered um, in 1995 by the Jason uh, group, and they said the greatest care in the form of self-discipline will be required to avoid system modifications, and they're talking about warhead modifications, especially those uh, in the nuclear explosive package, even if aimed at, quote, improvements, which may compromise reliability. So they were saying, you know, really, you shouldn't do this. Um, in 2002, there was uh, a uh, National Academy of Sciences report on the comprehensive test ban. They said the key to the stewardship of the arsenal is a stockpile surveillance program, which just means that you are uh, looking very carefully at the state of the warheads. You're monitoring them. The ability to remanufacture components to original specifications, really you're just refurbishing existing warheads and minimization of changes to existing warheads and then testing of the non-nuclear components, which you can do without uh, nuclear explosive testing. So again, they were basically saying uh, you have to leave the nuclear explosive package alone. Now, what's interesting, uh, and, um, and the weapons labs um, have in the last 25 years, um, gotten uh, more and more powerful supercomputers, this is the one at Livermore Lab, uh, which have allowed them to understand better and model better um, past nuclear tests and have really brought to the fore this question of what can you do without explosive testing. And so now uh, the NIS did another report on the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty uh, more recently, and they have changed their tune a little bit. So they say reuse of nuclear components from other tested systems and or nuclear component design changes that improve safety, security, and reliability could 
be credible and technically feasible approaches. Now, when they say reuse of nuclear components from other tested systems, um, what they're really saying is that you could take the primary from one previously tested warhead and, say, the secondary from another previously tested warhead and use them in a new warhead. Now, they go on to say, um, you know, this is something that you would need to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. And in some cases, we might need a greater scientific understanding than now exists. But it's a, a very different um, conclusion than the group reached uh, in 2004. So, uh, and, and there is, in fact, uh, the, the, um, the lab certainly embraced that notion. Uh, there was a program called the Reliable Replacement Warhead Program, which Congress actually kicked off in 2004, and there was a design announced in 2007, which was a new design for the nuclear explosive package. It was, again, using components based on previously tested designs, but in a configuration that had not itself been previously tested. Now, Obama canceled the program when he entered office, and he said that the RRW program would have created, quote, an entirely different warhead, and the administration did not foresee any reason to have a new warhead. So uh, this raises the question of, of what is, let me just go back, what is a new warhead? So um, the same year that he canceled the RRW, uh, the Nuclear Posture Review uh, came out and said very clearly the United States will not develop new nuclear warheads. And then it went on to say life extension programs will only use nuclear components based on previously tested designs. Uh, the United States will give strong preference to refurbishment or the reuse of nuclear components from different warheads, um, which is the very thing that he had uh, called out the Reliable Replacement Warhead Program uh, for doing and labeled it new. So here he's saying uh, this is actually not new. Um, and I would argue that the only technically meaningful distinction between new and not new would be whether the nuclear explosive package as a whole had previously been explosively tested. And if it fails that criteria, it, it's new. Um, you know, some things are maybe uh, um, uh, less of a deviation from previously tested designs and others, you know, it could be an entirely new design. But once the nuclear explosive package has not previously been tested, I would call it new. So, let's see here. Um, oh, and then what's interesting, this is, uh, this is from the um, Stockpile Stewardship and Management Plan that the National Nuclear um, Security Administration uh, puts out every year. So this is now uh, following on. Uh, the nuclear posture review where it said the U.S. will not develop new nuclear warheads. Now they've added an exception, except to improve safety, security, and reliability. So, uh, you know, really the cat is out of the bag. Uh, the U.S. is, is, is happy to develop new nuclear warheads. Um, so let's look at what it, what it is planning to do. Uh, the 3 plus 2 plan is the name of the current uh, plan for uh, our warhead, uh, for um, extending the life of our warhead. So um, the U.S. has, for each of its um, uh, missile-delivered systems, two warheads. So ICBMs, there's a W-78 and a W-87. For SLBMs, there's a W76 and a W88. And we also have a bomb and a cruise missile, okay? So we have four plus two is six. And the plan here is that instead of these four um, warheads on missiles, we would replace them with three so-called interoperable warheads. And the plan is that the first interoperable warhead will replace the W78 and half of the W88s, the next one, the W87, half the W88s, 
And down the line, the third interoperable warhead will replace the um, W-76. We're going to stick with the two air-delivered weapons. So that is where 3 plus 2 comes from. Um, now, what's interesting is it's not really 3. It's more like 6. So um, these uh, interoperable warheads will have a common nuclear explosive package, some common non-nuclear components, but different reentry bodies. Okay, you have a different one for the ICBM and a different one for the SLBM. So really, each interoperable warhead is a pair of warheads, one for ICBMs and one for SLBMs. Um, now, here is the schedule, uh, the current schedule. Let me see if I can turn on. Does everybody see a red arrow? Uh, I guess I should, Stephen, do you see a red arrow? Okay, I'm going to assume. Yes, okay, thank you, Scott. Okay, so um, what we see here is uh, that the W76 is in production right now. It's life extension program is, um, is in full, you know, we're in the thick of it. Um, the plan is that the bomb and uh, will start uh, production in 2020. What's interesting is that the W88 is not undergoing a life extension program, but something they call the Alt 370. Um, which is sort of a life extension program light. Um, and it will include replacing the high explosive and, you know, uh, other various refurbishments. And that is interesting. It comes into play later. And then you can see where things go from there. Um, the IW3 is off the chart. Okay, the assumption is that this W76 will need uh, – replacement or refurbishment in another 20 years, and that would then be the IW3. Okay, now I'm going to turn this off. Um, so let's look at the potential benefits of this scheme. The um, NNSA says there are three, that it would allow the U.S. to reduce its hedge of reserve weapons, it would reduce costs, and it would enhance safety. So the hedge, uh, you can think of it as sort of, you know, having two parts. Um, one is the technical hedge, and, and this is probably the thing that uh, people think about most, um, so that if there was um, all the warheads of one type had a problem, there was a system-wide failure, that then you could replace those warheads with another warhead that was in the hedge. Um, and then there's what people call the political hedge, where there's no problem, uh, but you want to increase the deployed arsenal for political reasons. And the question is, what is the relationship between these two? Um, what's interesting is there was a report in uh, 2013 under the Obama administration, which said that the U.S. had developed a more efficient strategy for uh, hedging and that a hedge that is sized and ready to address these technical risks will also provide the U.S. the capability to upload weapons in response to geopolitical developments. It was basically saying that the size of the political hedge was equal to the technical hedge. So if you covered your bases in terms of the technical hedge, that would be good enough for a political hedge as well. Um, so let's look at the question of a technical hedge. So this is a hypothetical example here. Um, so you have two warhead types on, say, ICBMs. Um, you have 100 of warhead X and 200 of warhead Y for a total of 300. And so on the hedge then consists of 100 W uh, warhead Y and 200 WX so that if one goes kaput, the other one is used to replace it, and you have a hedge of 300. So the hedge is the same uh, as, as the deployed warheads, which is sort of intuitive. Now, what happens under a 3 plus 2 scheme, where you have three warhead types, not two, <coughs> so you have uh, 100 each of these three different warheads, again, for a total of 300 deployed warheads, but now you have a hedge of only 150. 
uh, why is that? Because um, because you uh, basically uh, use the third warhead to hedge both against the first and the second. Um, and you can see here, uh, I don't want to belabor the point, but um, so WY uh, is a hedge for both WX and WC. So you, you don't have to, uh, you know, this is sort of double counting. So when you look at just what you need, because there's only one warhead type that goes bad at a time. That's the assumption. So anyway, you get 150. And that is the basis of the argument that NNSA makes that we will be able to reduce the hedge. Okay, makes a lot of sense. Now let's look at uh, New Start um, and what the technical hedge would be in that case. Um, these numbers might not be exactly right, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and the reason it's not 1550, uh, the reason it's 1750 deployed, is that there are counting rules for the bombs and the cruise missiles that um, it, that any airplane counts as one warhead, regardless of how many bombs and cruise missiles it has associated with it. So um, it's not really 1550. It's a higher number. Um, all right, so let's take a look at this. Uh, let's see. So um, if the 87s uh, go kaput, we have 78s. Uh, same here. Um, the W88 SLBM. Uh, missiles, we could um, instead uh, um, uh, deploy 400 W76s. Now it gets interesting because ideally, if your seven, if the W76 had a problem, you would want to um, instead uh, upload or uh, deploy W88s. But they're not available. We don't have any more. They're all deployed. So the best you can do is upload uh, additional ICBM warheads, W78. Um, these uh, um, are single warhead missiles, but they can accommodate three. So you could add another 300. That's where uh, this comes from. You could add more bombs, and you could add more um, air launch cruise missiles. And that's, that's the best you can do. I mean, uh, you know, you may not like it, but that is reality. And it has been reality uh, all along for decades. Uh, down here, it's a more straightforward uh, replacement. So because of this, you don't end up with 1750 in the hedge. You end up with 1250. And what this suggests is that, you know, the U.S. can reduce its hedge now. Uh, so right, again, these numbers might be off a little bit because things have changed. Um, basically, the the current hedge is greater than this required technical hedge by about a thousand warheads. So uh, this notion that you have to wait for the three plus two program, uh, you know, 30 years for it to uh, be fully implemented before you can cut the hedge, is nonsense. Okay. So we can go through the same calculation with the IW1 which, remember, replaced all the 78s and half of the 88s, which I'm not going to do. Um, I am going to just summarize it here. Okay, so remember we did uh, the current warhead types was 1250. After uh, the IW1, you have either 1300 or 1050, depending on whether you uh, build the warhead um, for the ICBMs and the SLBMs in the hedge, or whether you just produce the nuclear explosive packages, and then if you need ICBM warheads, you would then turn it into an ICBM warhead. Um, and that is a, is a, you know, you need fewer of those. Um, but in any event, at the end of the day, uh, when you have all of these warheads deployed, this is now 30, 40 years in the future, you have a hedge of 1,000 instead of 1,250. All right. Um, now, that was for New Start. What happens if you go to half of New Start or a third of New Start? Then, so, so what we just talked about was a 20% reduction. 
Uh, if you have a smaller arsenal, you get a 32% reduction, and a smaller arsenal yet, um, you get a 42% reduction. So assuming we go much lower, you will have uh, a bigger effect on the size of the hedge. But I want to ask the question of whether the U.S. needs a hedge at all. So Britain uh, has just one type of nuclear warhead uh, deployed on its um, SLBMs. Um, it has no tactical hedge. It has the ability to add more, um, but since it has one type of warhead, there's, if it goes bad, there's nothing they can do. France uh, is in the middle of, of changing warhead types, but it will have just one on its SLBMs, and it has one uh, for aircraft delivery. It has no hedge. Everything's deployed. Uh, so, not only does the U.S. have a hedge of these reserve warheads, it has two types of warheads per delivery system, and it has two types of ballistic missile delivery system. It's a little bit like a hedge on top of a hedge on top of a hedge. Um, and I think that the U.S. should use those big computers it has to try to quantify the odds of a technical failure. And because maybe there's just really no rational need for a hedge and all this redundancy. I'm not sure that they're busy doing that. So remember the second um, potential benefit was uh, lower costs. And that makes some sense. If you have a smaller hedge, you have fewer warheads, you have a lower uh, life extension program cost because you don't have to extend the lifetime of as many warheads. Uh, if you have fewer warhead types, then you have perhaps also a lower total cost for the life extension program. Or not. Okay, the life extension uh, costs per warhead vary widely. The W76, which was a pretty straightforward refurbishment, is $2 million a pop. The W6112, much more elaborate, is 10 times that. So, these, um, you know, the, the alternative is either refurbishing the existing warheads, which I would think would be significantly cheaper, um, or doing this more elaborate inter, um, uh, uh, IWs. Now, what's interesting is that in 2014, NNSA claimed significant cost savings. They looked at the cost of building and maintaining these, uh, the first two interoperable warheads and, and compared that to um, what it would cost to refurbish and maintain the three warheads that would be uh, replaced by IW1 and IW2. And they found that over, over that, you know, period of 30 years, 25 years, a cost savings of 3 to 19 billion. You know, that's not nothing. Uh, in 2015, they didn't say anything about cost savings. Um, and in fact, they had new cost estimates, um, wh which showed a pretty significant increase in the cost of uh, the interoperable warheads. And, uh, you know, th that increase was due in part uh, to assuming that there would be different fusing mechanisms for the SLBMs and the ICBMs and um, DOE had a new Office of Cost Policy and Analysis, um, which uh, probably did a better job of cost estimating. And so if you look at that, um, you get a cost savings of $16 billion or up to a cost increase of $7 billion. So it's a very, I mean, the estimates are, um, the cost estimates uh, are not very, um, they vary widely, so when you do this cost savings analysis, it also varies widely. But this whole uh, analysis does not include the cost of the IW3 compared to the next uh, W76 LEP. Um, it doesn't take into account additional DOD costs um, because both the Navy and the Air Force would need to conduct flight tests of these new warheads, and it doesn't take into account the cost of increasing uh, pit production capacity, which currently is about 10 pits per year, and the goal uh, is to have it be 50 to 80 by 2030 because the U.S. will want to produce 
new pits for these new kinds of warheads. Um, why is this not right? So the bottom line is that there is no cost comparison that looks at all the costs of three plus two versus refurbishment. But I don't. There is no reason to believe uh, that it will save money. Okay, let's look at uh, enhancing safety and security, which was the third um, benefit that NNSA uh, talks about. So uh, there is a goal of using insensitive high explosives in all U.S. warheads. Now, uh, this does not people might people think that that this or people sometimes think uh, that this um, would reduce the chance that there would be a nuclear explosion. It does not. Um, this is, uh, you know, the U.S. warheads have one point safety, um, and that is about the nuclear explosion. What this does is reduce the risk of plutonium dispersal so that the um, high explosive that surrounds the pit, if it goes off, uh, that plutonium pit gets, you know, vaporized and spewn around uh, the environment, which is a bad thing. Um, and so it reduces the risk of that. It also makes handling the high explosives safer for workers and reduces the need for special equipment for handling, which might lead to some cost savings. Okay. Um, let's look at um, the characteristics of these different high explosives. Now I'm going to turn on my... Okay, so this is conventional high explosive, which is what the U.S. used for its nuclear weapons initially uh, because they had not yet developed insensitive high explosives and is still what some of U.S. Uh, warheads use. So it doesn't take much. Um, if you have an explosive charge uh, next to um, this high explosive, it is only 0 0.001 ounces of TNT that is enough to set it off, uh, compared to uh, more than four ounces for insensitive high explosives. Much better. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that the explosive charge of a hand grenade is up to eight ounces. So this is better. It's not clear that it's significant in the, in the scale of things. Similarly, um, the shock pressure threshold goes from 20 to 90. The minimum velocity required for detonation by a projectile like a bullet goes from 45 meters per second to 1,000. But it turns out that there are guns and bullets uh, combinations that are up to and greater than 1,000 uh, meters per second. So. It's clearly much better, um, but how significant that is is a little unclear. Um, a jet fuel fire would cause the detonation of the conventional high explosive and not the insensitive high explosive, but a rocket propellant fire would detonate both of these. I'm going to come back and talk about the propellant in the missiles, but let's just look at uh, the high explosive. Okay, so this is what we have. Um, we have four weapons with insensitive high explosive and three with conventional high explosive. And the one that's really interesting, because the U.S. started adding IHE to the arsenal beginning in 79. And you'll notice that the W88, which began uh, production in 1988, uh, does not have insensitive high explosive. And that was because... It takes a little more insensitive high explosive to detonate the primary than if you use a conventional high explosive. So the warhead is a little bigger, it's a little heavier, and the Navy really wanted to put as many warheads on its SLBM as possible, and they wanted a, as long a range as possible. So they basically said, no, thank you. Uh, we don't want insensitive high explosives. And in fact, the benefits of insensitive high explosives uh, for SLBM warheads is less than for ICBM warheads. Why is that? Well, if we go back and look at this, um, 
So there is comparable to the conventional insensitive explosive. There is conventional and insensitive propellant. Um, and the Trident has the conventional propellant, where you can see it doesn't take much to set it off. The insensitive propellant, which the Miniman 3 has, um, you know, detonation is nearly impossible um, for a, a projectile or for a shock. And it is very large for an explosive charge. And what you'll see is that if something goes wrong with the propellant here, even, uh, you know, this is going to, if the propellant explodes, which it can do easily, then the incense of high explosive is irrelevant. So that is why um, once warheads are mated to SLBMs, the incense of high explosive is useless because if there is a detonation of the SLBM propellant, it, it's all over. Um, and the plutonium will be spewed around. Um, so now the IHE would provide safety benefits before the um, uh, uh, the SLBM warheads are mated to the missile. Um, so it's not an instant. Yeah, there is a, a real benefit um, to doing this. Okay. Now, what about the potential costs of three plus two? So there are technical downsides. So let's look at those. Um, in 2015, Jason uh, issued another report, and it noted that the 3 plus 2 strategy has uh, these goals, three warhead types uh, for the SLBMs and for the ICBMs, uh, these interoperable nuclear explosive packages, and insensitive high explosives. It turns out that these are, you know, you need to trade off one for the other. So um, choices regarding commonality, performance, diversity, and intrinsic safety and security features are in a competitive design trade space. And you could, uh, re if you require um, interoperability of the nuclear explosive package or um, insensitive high explosives, you may force a reduction in primary yield margins, for example. Um, what are they talking about? Oh, let's see. And they also say uh, it is more difficult to design and qualify a, a nuclear explosive package or even a non-nuclear um, explosive package component for two delivery platforms than for one. And again, you might end up with lower margins. All right, lower margins. So this is the primary yield, and this is the secondary yield. And you'll see, once you get up here, um, the secondary will basically uh, detonate. When you're down here, uh, you get kind of a fizzle. And the goal is, and, and this is the margin that people talk about, basically uh, from where this cliff is uh, to where you would ideally like uh, to have the design be. And what Jason is saying is that this will shrink and increase uncertainty. Uh, now, they also went on to say that if you have one of these new interoperable warheads in the reentry vehicle for the W88 and the W87, that it would change um, the mass distribution and various properties relative to those systems that we already have and have tested, um, which could change the details of uh, reentry flight dynamics and alter reliability or targeting accuracy. So in other words, there's no free lunch. Um, and I would argue that uh, pursuing this strategy would undermine the fundamental goal of the stockpile stewardship program. Uh, which was to ensure reliability. Uh, and instead, this might increase uncertainty about reliability. Um, so I, I think that's a really important uh, negative. So let's look at the political costs. Okay, I think there are two. 
Why the first one is uh why did Obama say that the US would not uh develop new nuclear weapons? Because he believed that building new weapon types would send the wrong message to the rest of the world. You know, why would he say that, especially if it's not true? And if the US continues not to test but develops new nuclear weapons, it really undermines a key rationale for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which was, as I said at the beginning, both to prevent non-nuclear weapon states from getting nuclear weapons, but also the nuclear weapon states from developing new weapons. And I would argue that that, uh, in turn, could undermine the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, because the CTDT has really been uh, something that the non-nuclear weapon states have focused on. And um, so this is not a trivial matter. I think uh, the second problem is that if we deploy these new warheads without testing, which is the plan, um, it could lead to calls in the U.S. by, say, members of Congress um, for resumed nuclear testing. I don't think the U.S. would resume nuclear testing, actually. Um, I don't, you know, I think the labs would be pretty clear, at least, well, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but uh, I think the labs at this point would be pretty clear that, you know, we do not need to resume nuclear testing. But that might change. Okay, so let's look at the costs and benefits. So the benefits uh, is you would get a modest reduction in the technical hedge in the long run, um, not now. And uh, insensitive high explosives would uh, be, uh, on the whole, a positive thing. It would not, um, you know, it, it would not solve all your problems, uh, but there would be some modest uh, benefits associated with uh, adding insensitive high explosives to all uh, U.S. warheads. Now, the costs are it's likely more expensive. There are these technical risks that could lead to uh, reduced confidence in reliability. And there are these political costs I just talked about. So people would obviously uh, weigh these differently. Um, my conclusion uh, is that uh, the U.S. should abandon 3 plus 2 and instead refurbish or retire existing warheads. And uh, it should really take a close look at whether it needs a technical edge. And at the same time, two warhead types per delivery system. It, it should really try to quantify the probability that one class of weapon will fail. And that uh, is uh, the end. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is Stephen. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, so, uh, Steve, better put a question in the chat, but Steve actually unmuted you. If you want to go ahead and elaborate on your question or not, uh, happy to do that if you want to. Oh, I see that. Or... Great. Well, it's kind of a flippant question, but at least this is how it was framed by uh, people who defended the. Um, uh, uh -huh. This was not a new warhead. Uh, these were both components that uh, were previously, you know, were designed years ago, uh, tested years, mm -hmm. many years ago. Mm -hmm. you know, mixing one with the other, you know, is that similar? But uh, could I could I just raise a couple of other things while I've got? Yeah. Them? So I I think I largely agree with everything that you've noted, I, but I would add to it, you, you began by saying you weren't going to talk about delivery vehicles, but all of this is intimately linked to the decision to replace Minuteman, because the first of the warheads, the IW-1, is driven by the fact that the W-78 uh, Minuteman warhead uh, right. is due to reach the end of its lifetime in the 2030-2035 time frame. So that's what's driving this decision. And um, and that, in turn, is driven by uh, the decision to replace Minuteman. Mm -hmm. So you know, if, if we decided to not replace Minuteman and go to a dyad, or we decided to rely on a smaller number of Minuteman 
then uh, it would be you know fairly straightforward to rely entirely on the 78 uh, sorry the 87 and you did raise Seven. that issue. do we really need all of this redundancy it's worth right. noting the 87 is widely regarded as the warhead with the greatest margin and also it has all of the safety and security features uh, right the 87 the 87 yeah. right and there yeah. are enough of them to uh, arm the entire you know minuteman force and right. so given that uh, ICBMs are, in a sense, a hedge of of, of sorts uh, for for the right. um, a failure of the uh, SSBNs. That perhaps it would be uh, there would be no problem with relying on a single warhead type for a missile that is not the foundation of our deterrent. Right. Um, yeah. I just want to uh, hold on a second. Go back to my. Slide, um, you're right, the first uh, interoperable warhead uh, is supposed to replace all of the 78s and half of the 88s, but the 88s are now undergoing this alt, which pushes their lifetime out farther, and, and you're right, so it's really driven by the W78, um, and that's a really interesting point you just made. Yeah. Scott, you said uh, you have questions? So, Scott, you're unmuted. Uh, hi, Elizabeth. Can you hear me? No. Yeah, a little louder. Sorry. Uh, why don't I put that? I can, if you can hear me, if you can't hear me yet, I'll just type them in. I, if you're faint. All right. Well, here's, there's the question in text. Oh, sorry. Uh, you'll have to skip the beginning. Uh, let me put, do that again. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? I put the question in text. So my question oh. was, um, you argued we don't need a hedge by citing Britain and France. Um, and I was, you know, I was dubious of the, your evidence in citing Britain because we feel they are similar to us. France may be better. Um, but it seems like these are really arguments against the technical hedge because Britain and France never felt they needed numerical parity with Russia. And if that's the case, then uh, wouldn't that ar suggest that really the, there's no argument yet for getting rid of the political hedge unless we change our deterrence philosophy? That's the first question. Oh. Um, um, Well, so this report that came out where the U.S. said, if we have a technical hedge, it's good enough for a political hedge. Um, you're right. If we said we don't need a technical hedge, there would presumably still be a desire to have a political hedge. Um, and you're right. It, it uh, Getting rid of that argument would require uh, concluding that the U.S. did not need to have complete parity with Russia and that our goal was, uh, you know, we had certain targets and as long as we could um, destroy those, that that would be adequate. Um, I, yeah, so that's a bigger conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really tackling that. Um, but it does seem like having a analysis of what is needed for the technical hedge would be useful. And uh, because the, these two questions are wrapped up with each other. And you can't really, you know, if you want to talk about the hedge, people will talk about, well, you know, something could go wrong. And if you if you lay that to rest, maybe you could have a conversation about how, you know, how, much do we need uh, to be able to suddenly increase uh, our arsenal? I, I, I don't know if that's satisfying. Uh, All right, let's yeah, see yeah. here. I'm trying to read your um, thing here. here right. This is, uh, I can just paste the second question. I put too much in my first page. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see. Uh, uh, the different yields. Right, uh, you're right that the hedge 
uh, if you replace one with the other uh, warhead, you're not getting the same thing. But there is no, you know, that's what we have. Um, and, you know, if you uh, have a problem with the 88 and replace it with the 76, that's different. Um, it, it just, you know, it's not perfect. Right. I mean, as I understand it, the way people think about the hedge, I could be wrong, and and maybe you know the plan is if the W, uh, you know, 88s uh, go bad, that there's a plan to you know add more than that number of 76s. Um, I this um, research uh, was vetted by um, people pretty hostile to my conclusion uh, who, you know, sort of know about what's going on in the inside, who are insiders. So they did not raise that issue, which I thought was interesting um, for what it's worth. Yeah, it does suggest that it's pretty political. Uh, Steve says targeting would have to be revised if the technical hedges were implemented, which seems like this whole numerical hedging strategy where we hedge 150 with 150 is totally arbitrary or arbitrary within some bounds. Um, all right, one last question. Um. Oh, here we go. Right. 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 Um, but I don't think we've tried. It seems like it would be a useful thing to try to understand what the risk of failure are. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so Scott writes on the proposal that we estimate uncertainties um, by uh, computation. Uh, he says uh, he doesn't really know how uh, this uh, uh, qu uh, quantification of margins and uncertainties, which is the um, sort of strategy that the U.S. uses for nuclear weapons, but he says looking at estimates of reactor safety using this probabilistic um, analysis suggests that we're not very good at doing this. Um, and, you know, there are complicated, um, complex systems. Uh, you know, it, it, there are lots of things that could go wrong in that we uh, are not very good at using calculations to uh, assess those. So, um, you know, he's saying perhaps there are similar unquantifiable uncertainties, the unkunks. Um, and I agree, but I, you know, I'd like to see how far we can get. Uh, you know, maybe uh, we'll learn something if we do these kind of uh, assessments. I mean, I don't expect that they would be public, um, but I think it's worth doing. Oh, so Stephen says, Steve Fetter says, uh, why we don't do that kind of analysis, because the result would have too many nines. What do you mean by that? Sorry, hold on. I need to unmute him again. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, Scott's right. I mean, it would be, you know, 0.9999 would be the, the probability the, the reliability of the overall system rigorously examined it using ERA. Oh, you're saying basically um, the odds of this kind of failure would be very, very small. Yes, I, I have asked. And they don't want that answer. At, well, this is what I have concluded. No one said that. Uh -huh. I have not heard a persuasive argument for why probabilistic risk analysis can't be applied mm -hmm. to warheads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why we use this sort of heuristic uh, uh, margins and uncertainties approach. Right, right. 
That's really interesting. And isn't the risk of failure much greater on the delivery vehicle, the delivery side of it, the missiles themselves, than the warheads? I would think. Yes. Right. Yeah, but that's different. You're talking about the risk of failure of one as opposed to a whole class of, right? There's a risk that a one warhead will not work. Um, but what they're talking about, the technical hedge is supposed to address the problem that an entire class of warheads, that there's some inherent problem that will make them, quote, unquote, not work. Um, of course, not work might just mean that the yield is reduced. I mean, it, you know, it might not be that it just sits there, which is another, you know, something else I think this analysis would ideally take into account. Um, so, oh, now we have another question. Um, oh, uh, so... Eric um, says he can't hear anything. Um, I don't know how to solve that problem. Uh, uh, all right, let me see if I can write. Um, I need to know the physical problem. History does. Frank asks, have you tried to educate Congress on this issue? Um, we have only talked to uh, Bill Foster uh, and have urged him, who is, uh, for those who don't know, a physicist in the House, um, not on the relevant committee, but nonetheless uh, with the uh, ability to try to request certain studies. Um, and we've asked him um, – he hasn't yet, but we're hopeful um, that he will sort of poke around um, and get a little more information uh, made public. But um, we no, the answer is no, we haven't. Um, and in part, it, it's because the three plus two uh, scheme doesn't really start for another several years um, because the IW1 – uh, doesn't go into production until 2030. And, you know, Congress is interested in the budget. So there are not very many, you know, the the, implica the budget implications uh, now are are not great. So it's, uh, it, you know, I guess that would, that would be my answer. Um, yeah, right. Senate right. Appropriations right. Committee. Stephen? So, yeah, Frank, Do you want to say something about this? Yeah, all right. Yes, Frank, we talk to the Senate Appropriations Committee all the time, and they're aware of these issues, but basically because of the fact that the the IW programs are so far out, um, they won't, don't even start until 2020, there's just very little interest in the Hill on most of these discussions now. Um, so basically there's, because there's no money being spent now at all on IW warheads. It's all being spent on B6112, IW, the W88 alt, and the W84 and finishing up 76. So there's basically no money in it, and so Congress just doesn't care. So they're aware of the issues, they've seen our report, um, and are happy to talk about it more, but there's really not a lot of point, most of this stuff, because the, as it says, the money is not till a ways away, and so the real goal is trying to get the DOE under pressure to change their plans before trying to get Congress to change, to oppose the plan. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I think that's about time then. Thank you all. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, everybody. We'll so I'll end the recording. If anyone wants to see it again, I'll, I'll, it'll be up available online. So the link to those is on the email 
David sends out has a link to all the past presentations as well. I suggest looking back at the one Pavel Pogdiv gave on the Russian nuclear update. It's a very in-depth and detailed presentation that gives you a lot of background on what she's doing, which is a lot. Anyway, thank you all, and we'll talk to you again soon.